You're listening to episode 97 of the Master Your Mind, Business, and Life podcast. There is an undisputed importance that gets mentioned time and time again on this show, and that is the importance of childhood. And if you're a parent, you know the desire for understanding your child. Sometimes our kids can be so much like us that navigating their needs or their love language and their overall personality can be easy peasy, lemon squeezy. And then other times we have kids who are the exact opposite of us. They challenge us in new ways and really push us how to learn how to parent in a constructive way that caters to their unique personality and individuality. Today's guest is Sandra Etherington, and Sandra is the owner of Family Personalities. It's a business that aims to help families through the use of personality types. Sandra helps families work together more effectively to raise their uniquely wired children to be the best versions of themselves that they can be. If something resonates with you during this conversation, Share it with me. I love seeing your screenshots pop up all over social media. I am everywhere on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Just tag me at MindBizLife and I will share your posts with our community. Also, if you think this episode will help a parent that you know, I encourage you to share it with them. Sharing this podcast helps us get into the homes, cars, and earbuds of many. This episode is sponsored by the Spiritual Seeker Affirmation Deck. This is a deck that I've created with the intention of bringing healing and awakening to the collective. You can use this deck as affirmation cards, oracle cards, or even notes of love to yourself when you are in need of a reminder from the universe. Just head over to laurensmithbiz.com, click on the Spiritual Seeker to place your order. Okay, are you ready to meet Sandra and learn how you can explore the personalities of your family? You know what to do. Tune in, turn it up, let's go. You're listening to Master Your Mind, Business and Life. Conversations with everyday world shifters, truth seekers, and rule breakers. Here's your host, Lauren Smith. Hey everyone, it's Lauren Smith. Welcome back to another episode. Today I am joined by Sandra Etherington. Sandra is the owner of Family Personalities, a business that aims to help families the use of personality types. Sandra, welcome to the show. I'm pumped to have you join me today. Hi, Lauren. Thanks for having me. I have so many questions to hit you with today, but I think where my mind naturally wonders to first is your journey. You have a degree in mathematics from UCLA and a background in big four counting. So how did all of that kind of lead to beginning family personalities? Yeah, it's not the original path I took. I think uh, yeah, <laughs> a lot of <laughs> a lot of mompreneurs would say that. Yeah, um, but you know, I have a very like systems analytical mind, um, and I like to understand how things work. And when I was in the business world, I was first introduced to Myers Briggs type, and that's where you that's where you usually find it the most. Mm. People use it for um, businesses like to use it for fostering team teamwork and better team communication and cooperation and all that. And it's really helpful in that space. Um, and so that's where I was first introduced to it. And when I learned my type, it was actually funny. It was, uh, <laughs> it was um, my ex who I was dating at the time. Um, and we were working for the same company and he took the training first. And he came back and started trying to tell me what my type was. And I was oh. like, oh, no, no, you do not know me, sir. <laughs> And I was like, I have to go online and learn about this yeah, so that I can prove you wrong. Um, turns out he was right. <laughs> oh, no way. <laughs> my type was. <laughs> no way. The entire type. He had the whole thing correct. I'm not sure if he had everything, but the one aspect that I disagreed with him on was the one that he got right. <laughs> interesting. So interesting. But um, it turns out I just had misunderstood what that aspect was. And as mm. I read further into my type, I just, it was the most eye-opening thing that I had ever read introspectively. Like I, I just resonated with it so deeply and I felt like, oh my gosh, this online description of who I am understands me more than I understand myself. Mm. It was incredible. And so from there, um, I just started getting my hands on everything I could, Myers-Briggs related um, and other personality types too. I'm really into Enneagram as well. Um, but Myers-Briggs just felt the most deep and applicable to what I was going through and learning about myself and everyone around me. Um, eventually, I became a stay-at-home mom. And as my kids were growing, I thought, can I apply this system of learning about yourself to my kids? Mm. 
And so I started diving into that and I learned I could and we implemented so many helpful things in our house around our kids that I wanted to start to help other people do that. And so when I got the itch um, about when my kids were, I don't know, maybe three and five or six, I started to get the itch. I was like, I don't want to just stay home anymore. Uh, what can I do? What, but I don't, I didn't want to go back to the nine to five thing. Um, and I thought, you know, what? I'm going to use my passion to help other families. And so I went and got all the training and all that. And um, that's what I did. And the rest is history. I love yeah. that. At what? Okay. So I'm, um, my mind is like already going in so many different directions. So yeah. what age can we start the the Myers-Briggs for children? What, what age can we start that assessment? Yeah, you can start observing mm. behaviors as soon as babies, but you can't fully type them yet. Right. Um, but definitely there are things you can see, like if you look, once you know your kid's type and you look back, you can say, yeah, that behavior as a baby <laughs> was consistent with their type. Like some types are more smiley than others. Um, some are more active than others. My son was one who always scowled, and that's very common of his personality type. So that's really fascinating that you can already see things that early, but certainly you can't fully type them that early. Oh I fully goodness. typed my own kids by the time they were two. Wow. Um, and at the time, I was like, this is just guess. I'll see. Right. It still sticks, right? <laughs> right. Um, but now they are uh, four and a half and seven, and it still is consistent um, with what I had guessed. Um, but when I work with my clients, um, we take, we call it a guess if the child is younger than seven. Okay. Um, and we just look at some of their behaviors and sometimes we can fully type them. Sometimes we only partially type them. If they're seven and up, they can participate in the process, which is, process, which is really fun. Mm, and fun. Um, yeah, they, there's a little assessment they can take um, that I have access to and, and they can kind of. Uh, do a little introspection with us. And then I also talk to the parents about the behavior. So awesome. Okay. Yeah, seven is kind of the official age, but you know, you can do younger too. You can take guesses. That was awesome. I love that you already were kind of, <laughs> kind of trying to figure them out when they were so young. And I'm sure you're a mom. I'm a mom. We both know that sometimes we have this like expectation that your kid's going to pop out and be just like you. <laughs> They're right? going to be I, everything <laughs> you imagine. And then they start forming their own personalities and you're like, whoa, my child is completely different than me. Yeah. So I, could, I can see how this would really be beneficial. When you first said that, I was like, I wish, you know, I wish right. they're exactly like me, but then I thought, wait, do I? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like a double-edged sword know. right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Fun fact though, my son is actually the same type as my husband. Really? Yeah. So oh. we've got two, two INTJs in my family. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Do you, does he find that it may be easier to, to parent that child or to just do they vibe better or do you not see no. any of that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> More buttheads. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's difficult. I and mean, they both have kind of this need for outer con control over their outer world. And mm. um, they are both trying to control each other. And that doesn't go very well. <laughs> oh, interesting. Well, let's back up a few steps because there sure. could be someone listening who's like, wait, Myers Briggs, what? Mm -hmm. Wait, what? Huh? So <laughs> can you just break down what exactly Myers Briggs personality type? model is and what it tells us about ourselves. Sure. So Myers-Briggs, um, if you've seen it around out there, is the personality type model that you see each type is denoted with four letters. So for example, my type is INFJ, mm. which stands for introversion, intuition, feeling, and judging. I'm the same one, and by the way. Oh, you are. I know. I've, yeah. met, I've met a lot of INFJ mom podcasters. <laughs> that does not surprise me. <laughs> So um, each and each of the letters basically stands for a preference. Mm. So there's an either or preference for each one. And usually the first one is the easiest one to talk about, and that's introversion versus extroversion, because most people at least have an idea of what that is. So um, you kind of think of the preferences as, I like to compare them to handedness. So I use the metaphor of being right-handed or left-handed. Okay. Which one are you? I'm right-handed. So if I asked you to sign your name with your right hand, how would that feel? Natural. Yeah, it would feel natural. You probably don't even have to think about it, right? Right. If I asked you to sign with your left hand, how would that feel? Oh, <laughs> like it's the first time I've used a pen. 
if, let's say you like broke your right hand yeah you had to use your left hand you know for a, an extended period of time right it's what unnatural feel like right it's mm-hmm. unnatural but it's almost like you have to train yourself mm-hmm. to do it yeah yeah and I you probably feel feel pretty exhausted after a yeah. day or a week and just like frustrated right right like I, I just want to go back to using my easier hand right so um, the Myers-Briggs preferences are kind of the same way. So all of us can do both. We can all use our left hand and our right hand, right? We have to, we do it all day long. Mm. Um, but using our non-preferred hand is just more awkward and frustrating when we're used to using our right hand. And you can work on it. You can get better at it, but you're always going to have that preference for your right hand. Even if you went, you know, two months with just using your left hand, you're probably going to still feel more comfortable when you get to go back to using your right hand. That's just your preference. Right. So it's the same thing with the Myers-Briggs preferences. We both use, we all use introversion. We all use extroversion. We have to, to function. You have to be outside of yourself and interacting with the world and with other people. And you have to be able to go inside and think and analyze and have some introspection. Mm. But there's one of, one preference that we all have inside of us that's just more comfortable right and when we have to use the other one for too long for too too much of an extended time that can feel frustrating it can feel awkward it can feel tiring and then we just really want to go back to using that more preferred function Makes so much sense too. <laughs> like yeah. anytime that I feel like I have to step out into like an extroverted type role, I always have to come back and recharge my batteries by being alone or having mm-hmm. quiet time. And it's not that I, I can't act in those roles of being in stage or hosting this podcast or um, I think a lot of time too people think that introverts like just aren't outgoing. And that's not the case. Right. It's just how we recharge, correct? Yeah, and especially with INFJs and ISFJs, um, both of those types use, and this is getting a little bit deeper and complicated, and don't worry, you don't have to understand it, but (laughs) there's also cognitive functions within the Myers-Briggs types, Mm. and at the cognitive function level, both of those types use something called harmony or extroverted feeling, and that's a function that really wants to connect with other people. And so INFJs and ISFJs can look like extroverts because we have that cognitive function that we use. That's really important to us. Ah, that, that also makes a lot of sense because I took the Myers-Briggs when I was in high school. Mm-hmm. And at the time, I, I can say that I was not extremely self-aware, right? And, and I also feel like in high school, you are still trying to be a people pleaser on so mm-hmm. many levels. And Especially trying, if you're an INFJ, yep. Right, and I took it, and of course, like, I don't remember what it was, but it's essentially like I was an extrovert. And for so yeah. many times, from the time, I don't know, it was like probably 17 until I took it again when I was in my early 20s, I identified myself as an extrovert even though that was completely not correct. And, oh man, it's just so many times I can look back and think, whoa, I was really not acting within myself or I wasn't even identifying myself right. So what happens if, if a child takes a test and then takes it again and has different results? Mm-hmm. So the assessments um, are not very accurate. They, especially if you're just finding a random one online, you really can't rely on those results. It's, um, it's a fun starting place, but they're, they're wrong more than they're right. Really? <laughs> yes. The official one through the Myers-Briggs company, which you can only access through a certified individual, right. is better. It's, um, it's, it's a lot longer than, than the online assessments. It has a lot more iterations and a lot more science behind it and people working on it. But it's still, even that one, which has been worked on for decades, is only about 80% accurate. Mm. So you cannot rely alone on the assessments. You have to work with someone who knows type. And, and the reason is the questions are like kind of like, um, what do they call it? First choice. Okay. Where like, and this is not one of the questions on the thing, but imagine if someone asked you, it's Friday night, would you rather go out with a big group of friends? big group of friends to a huge party or would you rather stay in and read what would your answer be 
Right. And you're like, well, it depends on the Friday night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that depends. <laughs> right. It's like, have I had a chill week where I need to see people or, um, you know, do I just want to sit inside? It really just depends on the Friday. Right. Yeah, right. totally. And I think an extrovert would answer that way too. Um, and so you really need someone who understands that gray area and can get to the core of it and understands the deeper level of the cognitive functions to be able to understand with help you understand what your preference is. Mm -hmm. um, and that works so much more effectively than the assessments, but they are a really fun starting point. Yes. So you clearly know your children's um, types. How has that helped you parent them? Mm. So many ways. <laughs> <laughs> Where to begin? <laughs> yes. So um, my son, who has INTJ preferences, um, he is not a naturally empathetic person. And as an INFJ, that's something that has been hard for me to accept about mm. him because I see him not seeming to not care about other people. It seems like the actions he does, he just doesn't care what other people want or think. Um, and that's really hard for me to watch. Right. It's not, and it's not necessarily that he doesn't care what other people want or think. Um, it's more that that just doesn't come naturally to him, right? Yeah. So I've learned phrases and logical explanations I can use to help him get to that point. And I find that if I logically explain, hey, when you tell your sister that you don't like her coloring, it makes her feel sad because, and then I go into the reasons, like she wants to feel like her coloring is good. It makes mm. her feel like, you know, and you have to logically take him from A to B. You can't right. just be like, you're being mean stop being mean, right? He doesn't understand why what he's, what he's doing hurts his sister. Mm. But if I can give him rules, because INTJs love those um, external rules for understanding other people's emotions and how to affect them, he actually does really well then Interesting. with taking care of other people's emotions. Hmm. And I, then, can, I can kind of see ahead. how um, like being in a school setting, mm -hmm. Could this just even knowing, I mean, uh, as a teacher, it may be like very overwhelming to know all of your kids' personality yes. types, but, but in the same breath, it would, it's almost like, wow, how amazing could it be to know them individually and why mm -hmm. they're functioning the way that they are? Yeah. And this is definitely used in the school system too. The training program that I went to for typing children um, focuses a lot on the educational environment and typing kids in a classroom setting. And I think um, with older kids, it's really helpful for them to be involved in the process, understand their own type and what they need out of a learning environment so they can self-advocate. Yes. And, that, and let's, let's talk about that a little bit more. So when kids do know their personality type, how does that like really benefit them? Well, for the first thing I want to say is that some people fear that we're boxing ourselves or our children in when we assign a certain personality type to them. Mm. Um, and I just want to dispel that fear because there's, first of all, there's no labeling people. So I, when I work with client, I never say, Hey, this is your type. <laughs> you understand the model and you choose your own type. Um, and we all grow within our type. And as I said before, the preferences, we can all do everything mm. we have. We can become strong in any area. You can as an INFJ, be good in any career that you want to do. But understanding that, hey, doing this sort of thing really tires me out and frustrates me if I have to do it all the time can help you make choices in your life that can bring better happiness because you're catering to your strengths. You're catering to your natural preferences. So if children have this understanding earlier on how many choices they can make in their life to bring happiness to themselves. I think it's incredible. It's really helpful with teenagers who are trying to pick a career, um, a career path or, or which college to go to and what major in and all that sort of thing. Yes. I think that's when I took it was, was around my junior, senior year while starting to look at those different outlets. With mm -hmm. your son, when you break down um, the reasonings to him in a more logical way, mm -hmm. does he understand what you're doing? Is he, is he aware of that or not so much yet? 
No, I don't think so yet. I have done a little type talk with him and he picks out his own preferences very quickly when I explain them to him. I, you know, I explain introversion and extroversion. He's like, oh, I'm the, I'm the, the I one, the one that starts with the I, you know, and I yeah. explain all of them to him and he picks his own. He's very, he's, he's very able to be quickly self-aware of it. I love that. Um, but he doesn't understand the details of it yet. And your daughter, is she a, a different personality type than your son? Mm-hmm. She has ISFP preferences. Ooh, so you guys are mm-hmm. all a little different. So how does yeah. that work in a dynamic of siblings? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so my son is not naturally good with other people's feelings, right? Right. My daughter uses a function called authenticity or introverted feeling, which is a really sensitive function. It's probably the most sensitive fun- cognitive function out of all of all the cognitive functions. Mm. Um, and they are they just get their feelings hurt really easily. So it's a tough dynamic <laughs> between yeah. the two of them. They're a little bit of a mismatch, but also if you think about it, they can kind of learn from each other and with a parent as a guide to help them understand each other, that can be really helpful. And with my daughter, I work a lot with her because she gets her feelings hurt by her big brother all the time. Yeah. Um, I work a lot with her on understanding that love doesn't come Love can be shown in different ways because a lot of times she says she thinks Riker doesn't love me, which is so sad to hear. Oh. But um, children and adults who who use that function, they when there's conflict or if someone's upset with them or gives them criticism, they fear a loss of connection. They fear that loss of love. That's mm. kind of like their core driver of of being of being so sensitive, and so. I work a lot with her on understanding that love can be shown in different ways. And that um, the fact that her big brother loves to play, um, they play this Pokemon game together where they are each a different Pokemon character. Um, He loves to play that game with you and he loves to do this with you. And that's how he shows his love. And that's how you know that he loves you. Oh, I love that. And it's so important to point that out to them because Mm -hmm. it, as you grow into an adult age, even, we all have different love languages and just being really aware of how you show love and how you receive love is, is instrumental. Right. Yes. Oh, I love that so much. So let's say that um, a client comes to you, a family comes to you and they are all different personality ty- um, types, mm-hmm. children, common. <laughs> yes, like everyone. <laughs> Can that be a very, um, I don't want to say like bad, because I don't, I don't want to say like bad dynamic, but can it be a Maybe stressful, yeah, a challenging dynamic to have? And how can you take all these different personality types within the family and actually work together as a, as a team, as a unit? Yeah. So when you look down, and I work really heavily in the cognitive function level of Myers-Briggs, which I know I keep mentioning and I haven't explained because it's just too much to get into on a quick podcast. <laughs> Um, but there are only eight cognitive functions. So within a family, there's going to be some overlap okay. and pointing out the similarities that you have with each other can be really helpful mm. and the opportunities for connection. Um, and then just understanding when you are very different from someone, it can be so helpful just to understand why, like, why are we having this conflict? Oh, you're looking at it this way. I'm looking at it this way. And that can be helpful. Even just the understanding of it can help diffuse that tension. Mm. I could also see how maybe that could help in a way that, especially in a teenager setting of, you know, you don't understand me. Like you don't, Mm -hmm. you don't know me. And maybe the parent is struggling to make that connection to just take a step back and see it from a different perspective. Yes. Oh man. I like, I, I just like want to do my kids so bad right now. (laughs) (laughs) What are you little humans? (laughs) Because I can see my oldest daughter is um, the opposite of me in very, very, very many ways. But my youngest mm-hmm. is very similar to me. Okay. So it would be, um, I think, interesting even as a parent just to know that. It's, so I, And I love that you point on figuring out where you're similar. Because I think so many times we figure out where we're different mm-hmm. so easy. It's like, right. oh. I don't, I don't act like that. Oh, that's not my reaction. And it's a lot easier to point those out versus, oh, hey, we do, we are alike in this way. Or yes, I do respond and react in a similar way. Yeah. It can be really helpful to understand those, those spots of connection. And we each have um, a function that's our play mode. 
And I really like pointing out when people have similar uh, play modes in the family, because it's a really great way to connect with your kids um, to go to that space with them. Oh, that is fun. And you had mentioned that you're, you're not opposed to other personality types. Mm -hmm. um, what does the Myers-Briggs offer that others may lack? Yeah, it's just a different aspect. So I know Enneagram is really, really popular right now. And I love Enneagram too. And I found it helpful in my own life. Um, but it just looks at something different than the Myers-Briggs looks at. The Enneagram is kind of the defense mechanism that you walk through your life with that was developed when you were very young. Um, and Myers-Briggs looks at more how you were wired. It kind of looks at two aspects. It looks at, um, first, it looks at, sorry, my brain is blinking. First, <laughs> firstly, it looks at how you make decisions. Mm. And the second thing it looks at is how you take in and um, sift through information. Ah. And so it's kind of your worldview, your perspective on the world is really about how you take in and sift through information, right? And then how you make decisions is really important to understand too, because other people are making decisions based on different rules. Right. And so understanding that they're not doing things. Look, a, a big thing for me to, to learn when I learned Myers-Briggs was other people are not making decisions to hurt me. <laughs> because that was one of my yeah. views growing up was like, oh, if someone did something to hurt me, they're doing that on purpose. Mm. Um, and it was kind of a big discovery to me to learn, oh no, they're just, they use different criteria than I do to make decisions. Yeah. And it, it's hard too to, to think that not everything is personal. Right. Especially yeah. for us, for, yeah. <laughs> for the Harmony users. That's a very difficult. Yeah. So um, the Enneagram, what does that kind of show us and what, how does that differ a lot? So I know you said it's like more of your defense mechanism. Yeah. The Enneagram has nine types and they're numbered one through nine. Okay. Um, I'm an Enneagram one, which is kind of the perfectionist reformer. And um, again, it's like the defense mechanism that you put into life based on your earliest traumas. Mm. Um, and then you walk through life with them because they worked for you when you were younger and there were these perceived threats and you created this way of being in order to function in whatever your environment was. Um, but as an adult, you don't need those anymore and they can sometimes be harmful. So like the perfectionist reformer for me, um, I would get so much anxiety about doing everything the best way possible. Right. And it was harming me. It was causing me anxiety. Um, I struggled with anxiety and depression for years. And doing that, understanding that part of me that doesn't need to be that way anymore because it was just responding to an early environment that doesn't exist anymore um, was really powerful to be able to work through that. I worked with a therapist and, and bringing that into my therapy sessions was really helpful. I bet. And uh, we talk about childhood. So, I mean, I can't even think of an episode that childhood has not come up in, in all of these, I don't know, 90 plus episodes. So, <laughs> and so I love that these two can kind of overlap and, yeah. and bring a different piece of the puzzle together. Yeah, they actually, they work really well together because as you understand your Enneagram, your defense mechanism, and start to work on that, you can uncover who you really are at your core, which is kind of your Myers-Briggs personality. And sometimes you can misunderstand who you are at your core because you're living in this defense mechanism. Mm. Um, and so sometimes when I'm doing my sessions, I don't, I'm not professionally trained in Enneagram. I only work with the Myers-Briggs. Um, but I, because I have the knowledge of the Enneagram, I can sometimes tell, like, oh, this person's acting in this way, but they might really be at their core this other way because they have this defense mechanism in place. Right. I know you've said that it's, or it's best to have a facilitator kind of help you navigate the Myers-Briggs. Although you could do it online, it's not as in-depth. Mm -hmm. um, what about the Enneagram? Can you, can you do that online or is that also better for a facilitator? Based. Yeah, you know, I can't speak as much to the accuracy of those assessments because um, I've never really looked into the statistics around that. Um, I was able to pinpoint my type. I did the assessment. Uh, I did a couple of assessments and I mostly typed as a two, um, which is the, the helper. Um, and a lot of women will type as two, even if they aren't. And I read uh -huh. once that as if you're, uh, especially if you're like a mom <laughs> yeah. or in some sort of helper role where you're constantly, you know, 
doing for others. Doing for others. You should rule out all the other types before you type yourself as a two. Ah. Um, because a lot of times we can think we're a two because we're in that sort of life role. Like caretaker type, always mm -hmm. in service, doing for others. Yeah. So yeah. I thought I was a two for a long time. And then when I read more deeply in the types and I kind of read the dark side of each type, it did mm. not resonate with the dark side of two at all. And I heavily resonated with the dark side of the one. <laughs> so, but yeah, you can totally read the different types. It's less complicated than Myers-Briggs. It's really easy to read the nine types and sort of figure out which one you identify with. Mm. Now, I saw that you are launching a podcast soon or has it already launched? Um, it will not have launched yet when this airs, but it will be very soon. I'm, I'm shooting for like around April 1st. Oh, um, I love it's that. Gonna be, it's going to be called the Family Personalities Podcast. And if you want to be notified when the first episode releases, go to familypersonalities.com slash podcast, and you can enter your email. And I'm just going to send out a quick blast to everyone when the, when the first episode airs. Perfect. And, t and tell us what you'll be, I assume, more Myers-Briggs, right? Mm -hmm. We'll be talking <laughs> about families and personality type. And it's going to be casual. It's not going to be super in-depth. I mean, maybe we'll get in depth here and there, but um, we want to make it fun. It's me and my friend who, my friend has zero training in personality type. Um, so she's going to be learning along with the listeners. We're just going to be talking about parenthood. Uh, we might bring in other personality type models and learn about them together with the listeners. Um, it's going to be fun and casual, but also a little bit informational. That sounds like so much fun. I can't wait to tune into that. And I love that you are having a friend kind of come in with all bright eyed and bushy tailed who is not an expert because I always think that sometimes the best questions come mm -hmm. from those who are so curious and are diving into this topic. Yeah, that was my exact thought. I love it. What a great balance. You know, I know our audience is definitely going to want to check out that podcast and connect with you further. So where can they go just to learn more about you and what Family Personalities has to offer? Sure. So familypersonalities.com. That's my website. Uh, you can schedule a free intro consult if you just want to chat a little bit about your family and, and if this might be a good fit for you. Um, or uh, follow me on Instagram. My handle is Family Personalities, and I post a lot of really fun stuff about personality typing kids and parents, and people have a lot of fun in the comments, like, oh, this one sounds like my son, but my daughter sounds like this one. Um, so if you want to follow me on there, I do a lot of stuff. You can find me on Facebook, too. I'm not very active on there, um, but it's FAM, F-A-M, Personalities on Facebook. Beautiful. I will link this all on the episode notes as well. Sandra, I learned so much valuable information today. I'm just going to implement it into my own life. I'm going to start with my oldest daughter and I'm, <laughs> we're going to kind of try and figure out her personality a little bit more. And I know our audience is going to want to do the same. So thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your light. Thank you, Lauren. How awesome is Sandra and the work that she does? I mean, so cool. I have linked Sandra's website and social channels on this week's episode notes found on mindbizlife.com. Next week, we're celebrating the 100th episode of the podcast, and I'm going to be hitting you with some juicy info that you're not going to want to miss. Of course, I'm going to be back on Friday for another episode of Feel Your Life Friday, but until then, remember, every level of life is an opportunity to grow. Be well, my friend.